Good evening, and I want to welcome everyone here to um, Second Life uh, for the world's first virtual debate. Actually, all of us are on different locations, and our electronically assembled avatars have gathered in this location to discuss some issues tonight. Uh, I want to thank St. John University, uh, and I want to thank the library system and the speech and debate program there for all their work. I specifically want to thank uh, Dr. Steven Yano, who's uh, in the back, and he's uh, uh, going to be hovering there in the air as he uh, videotapes this so that we can show other people that uh, it actually uh, happened. Uh, I think that the motivation behind this debate is not just to do something different and not just to play around with toys, to use them because we have them. I think the idea behind this is to be able to dissolve the difference that keeps people all over the world apart. People don't have the money to travel to Mongolia or Thailand or Chile or Poughkeepsie, New York to debate other people, but through the use of a virtual world, we can all gather and debate against each other, and we might have a debate that has people from many different uh, locations. As with any first-time technical event, uh, I expect there to be some kind of snags at some point. Um, if you'll just be patient with us, if this should happen, um, that would be good. I want to ask all the members of the audience to please keep their microphones turned off during the debate. And at the conclusion of the debate, we're going to be inviting questions and comments from people in the audience um, who have things to say. But during the debate, uh, we could have problems with feedback or background noise. So if you could keep uh, your microphones off, that would be good. So I don't guess I need to say turn your cell phones off like you would in a, in a normal debate, because we don't have that problem. Uh, and so I just want to say that you are now about to watch history being made. Okay, maybe it's not big history, and not it's earth-shattering history, but for the first time, we're going to have an academic debate in a virtual reality, and hopefully to demonstrate a process that can become uh, very exciting very large and very inclusive. So uh, thank you all for coming. And now um, on with the debate. I'd like to introduce the chair of tonight's debate. Uh, that's Peter from Slovenia, will be our chair, and he will call our speakers. Uh, Steve Yano in the back will be our timekeeper. We'll be debating in the American parliamentary debate format. Thank you. Thank you, Tuna. Um, I would like to welcome everyone also from the old continent here. It's a nice snowy night, I must say. Uh, I'm very excited to be here and to see the debate. But it's not about me. It's all about the debaters. So let's hear who we have. On the government side, we have two debaters from the St. John's University, the Prime Minister Tim and the member of government Don. On the opposition side, we have two members of the two debaters from the University of Vermont. This is member of the leader of the opposition is going to be Tuna. We have seen him right now. And the member of the opposition is going to be Jacob. We will also hear some rebuttal speeches. First, we'll hear an opposition rebuttal and then a government rebuttal. And the motion from the House as that this House would abolish faculty tenure at colleges and universities. With no further ado, I would like to invite the first speaker, the Prime Minister, to deliver his speech. Team, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So today, as you have heard, we are here to talk about how this house would abolish the faculty tenure at colleges and universities. So to begin this debate, I'm going to talk about the purpose of the university. 
And we, on government side, believe the purpose of the university is to educate the students, to create a more informed populace, to create better citizens who can think for themselves, to edify the culture through distilling ideas into this populace who will then use these ideas in their everyday life. But perhaps most importantly is that universities should support public discourse. So let's take this instance um, of our debate as an example of what universities should be doing. But under the current system of tenure, this would be impossible for a professor to claim this debate as something worthy of academic publication because publication is only comes in certain kind of forms to be considered academic. So our main points here today are the fetishizing of self and how the university fetishizes itself in the, the tenure process. How there's a divorce of learning created by um, this tenure process between the research that it requires and the classroom experience. And my partner will speak to you about the cloak and dagger methods that tenure employs. So first, onto the fetishizing of self. The opposition will come up here and tell you that tenure protects academic freedom and that it really encourages this public discourse which is essential to the university. But let's take the example of Cornell West. Cornell West is an expert in a variety of fields including race relations and history. I'm not pointing and he, um, not, not this time. And he, he took, he has many books published throughout the um, nation that are on this. Now Larry Summers who is the president of Harvard University told Cornell West when he was tenure track that he did not have any academic publications. And so this, I think, proves the point that the university in the tenure process does not want to encourage public discourse, but wants to have some sort of academic exchange which is excluded from the public discourse. And academic publications mean elite, non-public, and non um, and specialized publications. This is an all idea about keeping information to itself and it destroys the purpose of the university. All of the work that is required for tenure, tenure is goal oriented, but the goal is divorced from the actual research. The goal here is tenure, and the re so the research doesn't have as its goal its own end. So this creates a problem as the research then becomes effective, not effective. Is there a point? No. Yes. How can you expect teachers to be proficient at teaching courses if you didn't give, provide them enough time to develop the course over a tenureship? No, sir. We, we are not arguing against research, and we are not arguing against the development of courses. What we're arguing against is tenure, as it, is, it codifies what type of research the, per the teacher should be allowed to do. Certainly, teachers will do this on their own if they are allowed to. They want to improve their own courses, but under the current system, they don't have time to actually do the coursework because they are, which will, brings me to my next point, the divor divorce of learning. So now we set up this dichotomy in the university between research and the classroom. Now, to fulfill the purposes of the university, which I have already outlined, the classroom is where this needs to take place. This is where the information and the research which the professors are doing are being given to the students who will then go out into the public and use these ideas for practical, efficacious, important, world-changing purposes. This is where the ideal ideas come to life. So some of the practices of tenure which break down this idea. Many professors under the stress of tenure, which requires, um, tenure does vary from university to university, but often requires several books and several academic articles to be published under the seven-year tenure period, means that they don't have enough time to focus on the classroom per se. So they will hire teaching assistants to do the classroom work while they focus on the research. Now if the research that the professor is doing is not being communicated to the class, then what is the point of the research? Who is benefiting from this research? On government side, we believe only the academic community. And we think this is a serious public harm because then the university f fails to serve its purposes, which we have already outlined. Now, tenure, tenure specifications I'm are right, already... Right, sir. Yes, sir. So you're saying that research is a waste of time? Isn't that the point of a university, to provide opportunity for faculty? I understand, I understand your point, sir. I understand your point, sir. Okay, well, I, it's not that research is a waste of time. In fact, what takes up more of the time is the, 
the principle of publish or perish because the not only do you have to do this research, they have to formally have this published in academic journals. This is a time-consuming process, which is not focused on the classroom per se, but focused on this self-loving community which they have created. This is a very expensive and elaborate form of self-love, and in public universities, this is self-love being uh, funded by the taxpayers, and it's not benefiting the public at large. So this is the problem that we have, sir. Not with research. Of course, we support research in universities by keeping the classroom cutting edge. It's when research becomes divorced from the learning that it becomes a problem. Often, it is no secret that the classroom becomes seen as a burden under the tenure system because by the constant demands of publishing their work, there is no time for the professor um, to have her classroom experience edified and to so the classroom is simply going into the class teaching and then leaving and the research becomes divorced in this process also undergraduates become less valued than graduate students because often undergraduates are having intro and beginning courses which are not related to the direct research which the professor is doing and so then she does not feel that the undergraduate classes are as important and so this creates another dichotomy in the university which we think is harmful because undergraduate education is obviously just as important and as fundamental as graduate education so to sum up what we think are the problems with tenure the following it destroys the university and the purpose of the university by the not encouraging public discourse it favors certain types of education over others as I mentioned in my intro, which my party will cover, um, it is self-replicating a certain codified um, academic standard and values, and under the guise of academic freedom, but really ends up narrowing this academic freedom. So, for all of those points, we we hope that you accept this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Tim, for your speech. And uh, we're turning to the opposition side. Tuna, it's your turn to deliver your speech. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a great honor to be here in this august virtual house talking to this learned virtual assembly on the issue of tenure. It's interesting that the government says, well, we have the purpose of the university to educate, to create citizens, to edify the culture with, with new ideas, uh, and to create public discourse. You know, I think tenure helps to do all of those things. Uh, William Sherman, who's a scholar at the State University of New York, has put it this way, higher education in America is not perfect, but tenure does not cause our problems. Tenure, in fact, reduces them. And that's going to be the perspective of the opposition team in today's debate. I want to look at some of the things Tim said, and then I want to present a couple of arguments uh, of our own. We're going to argue, for example, that, yes, Tim, you're right, tenure promotes the academic freedom, and guess what? We think it's important. Second, we're going to argue that tenure increases the level of knowledge in our society, and we think that that's a good thing. It was interesting that, that Tim began by saying that uh, you can't claim these sorts of things for tenure, like you couldn't uh, claim this debate. Well, I don't know how to break it to you, Tim, but I certainly am going to claim this debate on my veto. I'm certainly going to claim that I was, uh, you know, the first opposition speaker uh, in a virtual debate. Much like I've received tenure based on my work on the Internet, my creation of websites, my creation of, of teaching uh, DVDs to, to promote debate. I know I have theater colleagues who get uh, their tenure credit for their creative work that's, no thank you, that's not necessarily normal. They might go to a, a guest theater. They go to Washington and perform at the National Theater. They may make costumes. Uh, not just, it's not just books and articles that count for tenure, especially in the 21st century. 
Tim's first argument is about fetishizing, and I'm not sure I understand this fetishizing thing, but, you know, I would say that to get tenure, you have, your teaching is evaluated, your scholarly work is evaluated, and your university service is evaluated. So all these things are evaluated, and he gives the example of Cornell West. My goodness, what would have happened if there was no tenure at all? Cornell West would just be summarily dismissed by Larry Summers, who I used to judge when he was a debater, by the way. Uh, and, you know, and I'm n not necessarily proud of that. And, you know, did, what would happen when Cornell West left Harvard and he went to Columbia, where he received a position with tenure? He has security, and his ideas are being voiced. I don't think the Cornell West argument works for you, Tim. Next, he says that we have divorcing uh, of learning uh, from the classroom. He says, there are a lot of teaching assistants. You know what? If there weren't any tenured professors, they might all be teaching assistants. Uh, I think that, that the policy that you advocate only makes things worse. And remember, that's our team line uh, in, in this uh, debate. Um, and he said, yes, I'll take your point. So about um, the teaching assistants, how does the to the classroom, get to the classroom when there are teacher teaching assistants being used. Uh, I'm sorry, you're breaking up. Try it again. How does the research, which is vital to the classroom, get to the classroom when teaching assistants are being used by the professors? Because the professor still dictates the curriculum. The professor still requires the text. The professor still looks over what's being taught. The TAs don't make up the curriculum for the course. They just implement it. Very good. All right. Then, you know, I, and I, I think Tim misunderstands, you know, this focus on undergraduate depends on different universities. There are many universities that do focus on undergraduates. There are large research universities who focus on something else. At the University of Vermont, we're very much focused on undergraduate education, so that's one reason why I like it here. I would now like to turn to our two major arguments, and that is we think that tenure promotes academic freedom. What is academic freedom? That means that I, as a faculty member, have the right to say what I think is right, what I think is important, and to pursue perhaps unpopular paths of research. And I don't have to worry about whether the dean might be a conservative, or a fundamentalist Christian, or a Zoroastrian, for, for, for that matter. I can go ahead and pursue what I think is right. Academic freedom is necessary for a university dedicated to the pursuit of knowledge in a democratic society. Academic tenure is the best defense of academic freedom that American universities have found so far. Let's take a state university. What if a conservative government, a governor is elected? Should all state university faculty who are now liberal fear for their jobs? The reverse, when the liberals get elected, fire all the conservatives? The state's oh, universities, sure. no thank you, the state's university could be turned into a political machine in which the, per truth is, in the, which the pursuit of truth is subject to the dominant party's agenda. And I don't think we want that. I think there's a good analogy here, and that analogy is to civil service. In public administration, we have civil service jobs. They are not political appointees. They are guaranteed that they're going to keep their jobs. Now, you can lose your job for miss, mal, or nonfeasance, or not doing your job, but what it does, it protects our civil servants from the winds of political change, and I think that's good, and I think it's even more important. No, thank you. I think that's even more important when you're talking about uh, universities. Our second argument is that tenure increases publication. Uh, thank you for the coaching on, on moving my microphone a bit away. Uh, <clears throat> we think that the, the, the tenure increases knowledge. Teaching is important. Scholarly work is important. University service is important. But we think that without tenure, then what will the professors be doing? They'll be thinking of how, what they can do to impress and satisfy their bosses, just like they do in the corporate world. You know, we need to make the university different than the corporate world. We need to make it a place of intellectual 
freedom, where you can say whatever you want and publish whatever you want. You know, there was a 1993 study of the National Post-Secondary Faculty by the Department of Education, and they showed that tenured faculty members teach more students, engage in more scholarly work, and serve on more committees in university service than non-tenured colleagues. We need to create dynamic new knowledge for the 21st century and beyond. I think we need, Jacob and I believe, we need academic freedom to do that. We need a university that's going to uh, promote academic freedom, that's going to increase knowledge, because at the end of the day, that's going to make a difference. So Jacob and I are very proud to say that we oppose this motion. Thank you, Tuna. And I turn back to the government side. I would like to invite Don, as a member of government, to deliver his speech. Mr. Speaker, for the floor, it is now my pleasure to speak on behalf of the government. At this particular time, I can only agree with a few things of what Tuna just came out and said. The fact is that he said that it is true, the study did say that only tenured professors seem to show the fact is that they can help the students do more. But why is that, we must ask ourselves. The fact is, ladies and gentlemen, is because we can sit here and go, and the professors that have tenure are not worried about their job because they're not sitting there being put through the rings, the circles, and the hoops of trying to get tenure. The fact is that they are sitting there no longer worried about trying to be uh, put through this particular vague system that is tenure. Because when they, the professors sit there and are working to try to sit there and to go through whatever it is that this committee that is going to award them tenure is going to sit there and say that, okay, your work, we consider it to be within our circle. And that's all, that it's time that you can sit there and know that you're going to be allowed to do this. Now, the problem with this is, ladies and gentlemen, is that this does not promote the increased knowledge. The fact is that Don, I don't think your mic's on. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah. The value of that works out rather well. Okay. Now, to sit there and respond to what Tuna just said, the fact is that the reason as to why the university should not be a political orientation is because we do not need tenure to do this. All tenure does is sit there and create a further problem and a further political politicalization of the university because it says that each and every one of these professors, if put into the seven-year window, has to do whatever it is that the university dictates to be fit to sit there to receive a job for that tenured time. The fact is that when you sit there and have this particular system, the fact is that in this system, we have this committee that's created that sit there and is going to come up with, say, uh, let's say it's going to consist of eight or nine professors from any given schools within the university in any given field. That generally consists of who is going to decide who is going to receive tenure and who is not. These particular people are given a set of vague criteria in which they sit there and have to simply evaluate the work and determine what is scholarly, what is um, the as Tuna said, the fact is they're supposed to show university service and scholarly work. But what exactly does that mean? The fact is we can look recent to the recent Supreme Court case in which the reason the Supreme Court is looking into this now is the fact is because there is a problem with this because it leads for so much room for discrimination within the, uh, within the field. Point, sir. Yes, go ahead. Well, what is the alternative criteria you propose? Do you propose they make the classes so easy that everybody passes? 
No, no. What we're proposing here is with the professors is that they're going to do exactly what the professor is supposed to do, to teach these students. Because when they're sitting there and they're working towards tenure in the seven-year period, all it is that they're focusing on is writing their papers, is writing their articles, doing their research, and not actually serving the student. The fact is that they see it as a burden. The fact is that they have to step away from their study and they have to step away and go teach these students. That's problematic on several levels, ladies and gentlemen, because what it is Point doing... Information. Go ahead, Tina. All right, I mean, I already said that you're evaluated for tenure based on your teaching, on your scholarly work, and on your service. So how is teaching ignored? Teaching is ignored because it is sat there and looked as the bottom point. The fact is the university, when choosing which professors to give tenure, they're looking at the scholarly articles that they publish, these six or seven articles, maybe a book or two, depending upon which university, because no one university has the same criteria for tenure. There is no universal notion, the fact is, that these are the standards. It is vague and up to the university to sit there and decide. The fact is that they may put some 10%, 15 20 or whatever it is on actual teaching and the rest may be on the rest of the criteria. The fact is that we this is problematic because we have this problem in which the students are not learning because these professors that are stuck in this period are not focusing on the students. They're not really trying to help these students. All they're trying to do is sit there and get their tenure so that they can secure their own job and then they can sit back and do whatever it is that they want. Now ladies and gentlemen, ask yourselves, which type of knowledge do we want to be instilling upon our people? Do we want to have this monkish knowledge that is the, pro that is the system of tenure and the fact is that the individual is looking only for himself, he's only doing research for his knowledge, for his betterment, for his name, and so forth? Or do we want the professors to sit there and have the ability to go out and to teach these students do we want to sit there and have this Jesuit notion, the fact is that they're going to go out and to help these people, to help them learn, not to see it as a burden? The fact is, with tenure, you are only concerned with the self. No, thank you. You are only sit there and concerned with your... No, thank you. You are only concerned with yourself. You are not concerned with the with the field of study in it itself. The fact is that you're focused on only that one goal, which as Tim eloquently put it, is so divorced from the subject of learning, it is so diverse, uh, divorced from the notion of research, the fact is that it no longer is connected with this notion. The fact is that this professor is striving for something that is far beyond his reach, far beyond his capability because of the vagueness of the system. The fact is that this system does not create for academic freedom. What it does, it allows a professor to sit there for however long they want from death, from the day that they get tenure until they die, however 50 many years that may be the fact is that they cannot lose their job even though the fact is that they are doing absolutely nothing they could sit there and have this grad student teach their class allegedly who is going to be teaching the course material but ladies and gentlemen who is going to know the knowledge more? Who is going to be better able to teach it? The professor who sat there and did the research or some grad student that who doesn't have the qualifications, who doesn't sit there and know the material as well as the professor, who has not been through all these steps and rigors? The fact is that when you have a tenured professor, the fact is they see this as an elite system, an elite group that is sitting there within their faculty office deciding who gets to come in and who doesn't? Ladies and gentlemen, the fact is that when you sit there and allow this system to exist, you are just furthering the fact is that this sort of guild S system, the fact is that we are going to accept whoever we want into tenure because we feel that they're qualified enough. The fact is that it is discrimination in and of itself. The fact is that tenure divorces this notion of learning. And the fact is that it is the fetish of the self that is created. And for those reasons, we proudly Thank you, Don. And we are now going to hear the last constructive speech and it's going to be Jacob from the opposition side. The floor is yours.
Thank you. What a wonderful audience we have tonight. Well, I'd first like to start off by giving a little introduction to myself. I have the pleasure of being a student employee and being able to work with um, the professors at the University of Vermont, helping them develop online courses for the Center of Teaching and Learning here at the University of Vermont. And it is a wonderful pleasure to work with uh, these professors. And it is a great example of how tenureship provides academic freedom and it is, provides betterment for the students. Without tenureship, students cannot, um, or faculty and teachers cannot work to develop the best courses. Once you start teaching a course, you must work to go through the, the, the ringing of it and work out the kinks. And some of the best courses taught here at the University of Vermont have been taught for over 30 years. And there's no way, without tenureship, that you can have that level of proficiency in, in, in a professor without tenureship. And if we leave this room today with the uh, notion that tenureship is not helping our students, we are sacrificing that, um, we are sacrificing the, the that point, development sir. of really good courses for the University of Vermont and for all universities that, that have point. still tenureship. No, thank you. So I'd like to take a few points that Don had and um, refute them. Um, Don talked about how without tenure, faculty, or with tenure, faculty don't work. And this is just completely ironic. Um, the notion that, you know, if faculty's jobs are always up for review, that they will um, always be focusing on their classes. Like, how could anybody possibly focus on a class, focus on teaching, if they were constantly up for review. Um, and that, that, that's what a system without tenureship would instill. It leads towards... Um, Morning, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, I'll take your point. Uh, how are they focusing on their class? Can you say that one more time? I can't hear you. Research. Under penalty of losing their job. Well, um, I can't hear you, so I'll just be moving on. Um, try again with the mic later. Um, one more time? Yeah, go for it. Um, how is it that they can focus on their work, or their classroom, if their research, they have to focus on the research through the seven-year period under the penalty of losing their job? Well, once they have secure tenureship, they don't have the worry of losing their job. See, the whole point of tenureship is to minimize that um, point in a faculty's uh, career or a professor's career when they're not focusing on their students and they're focusing on job security. Um, without tenureship, they would spend their entire time focusing on their job security and not on the students, and not on their research, and not on furthering academic knowledge, which is the entire purpose of a university. John also said that, um, you know, that, that elite publications and, and elite um, this is bad in the university. Um, well, you know, what, what is this real eliteness? Eliteness means that they're good professors. Um, that's what it really is. It's just a slander on on, on what what we call good professors. And um, what what they what he really means is that um, that elite professors are are um, going to be good professors. And um, if we don't have this tenureship, this process of weeding out the people that are not the best professors, and that are not the best researchers, um, will be just left with mediocre professors. On that point, sir. Yes, sir. Is it, but even by you saying good professors, aren't you appealing to a standard which is against the standard of academic freedom? You're saying that the university has codified a standard of what is good and what is bad. Well, I, I understand your point, but you fail to see that 
you provide no form of evaluation except constant evaluation and constant evaluation as both sides agree here when when Period. professors are under constant evaluation they cannot focus on their teaching um, so it's it's not the standards of evaluation a, a university of itself can be trusted to decide what standards are, are, are required for a tenureship but the tenureship or, or for a non-tenureship. But the opportunity that tenureship provides, no thank you, is that it'll be freedom from that evaluation uh, and that constant pressure and, uh, and allow them to really do what they were hired for and to really provide knowledge to the academic community and the greater community beyond that. I'm going to be moving on to... Um, one of my new points, talking about how um, tenureship makes universities a unique place. Um, it, it makes universities a place where unique people come to teach. Because under a system without tenureship, you'll have people who come there um, for the money. And people who come there... Um, who just want to make a buck and um, tenureship provides incentive for people who really want to teach um, for people who don't want to play the latter game of corporate environments we don't want a corporate um, school we don't want a, point, you know, a school where your TPS reports are evaluated every morning no we want a school where there is freedom and there is democratic thought, and that um, tenure reigns on, and that's the only way to have a good university. Um, without tenureship, you will have a paper-pushing, busy bee, um, waste of time, red tape, corporate university, and tenureship provides a break from that, and, pro and it will attract people who really want to just come and teach and really just want to further their knowledge and further the knowledge of all. Um, that's why tenureship should be always preserved and always preserved in the university environment. I'm going to also reiterate on some of the points my partner so graciously spoke of. My partner talked about how um, tenureship provides um, a safe haven for the university from political scrutiny. Um, he talked about how uh, if, if a democratic um, you know government was was in the state that they could fire all of the um, non-democratic teachers the teachers who were pro opposing their policies uh, politically but the tenureship they can't do that it provides a safe haven for freedom and, and academic um, Okay, it's time for my speech to be done. So, uh, to sum up, uh, we win on that provi it provides more academic freedom and uh, it stops busy bee waste of time mentality. And thank you, thank you. Thank you, Jacob, for your speech. And we're now going to the rebuttal speeches, speeches that where the points of information are not allowed. We are going to hear the first rebuttal speech from the opposition side. Tuna, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, what a great event this has been, except for a few mic drop-offs. It seems to work. There are a couple of important things that I think the government has not come to grips with. Academic freedom is essential for a progressive university in a democracy. I don't want to have to worry because there's a Republican governor in Vermont that I'm going to be fired because I question the viability of capitalism. We need open thinking. We need free thinking and at the university most of all. And I don't think they've come to grips with that idea. I don't think they've come to grips with the idea of increased knowledge. 
Planet Earth faces huge challenges. Do we need more research, more scholarship? Yes, and not at the surface, not at the surface of corporate taskmasters. We need knowledge that's going to be freely available to all. A couple of other points I want to mention in summarizing this debate, and I think this kind of summarizes the, 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 the points that the government uh, has been uh, making. They talk about a vague committee who's not going to be sure how to evaluate. Listen, you get your tenure and promotion guidelines are written down in stone. You have outside evaluators, you have departmental evaluators, you have college evaluators, you have university evaluators. And if you don't like the decision, you can appeal because the tenure process gives you due process. They say we're going to have bad teaching. Yeah, when the whole university is consisting of the teaching assistants that they insult so roundly, when universities hire people on the cheap and not cultivate long-term scholars, teaching is going to get worse. And I want to repeat again that you get evaluated on your teaching. Uh, finally, I want to talk about the future of the university. You know, if we don't have tenure, the vision of the university in the future is pretty scary. Every faculty member is always looking out for their next job, which they said hurt teaching. Open discourse and the free exchange of ideas will be severely blunted. Long-term research will end as faculty wait for the axe to fall and for their next job. More non-productive time will happen as faculty have to settle in to new situations and cannot cultivate a long-term relationship. And finally, students, if faculty are moving around all the time, finding them to get your letter of recommendation is going to be a real hassle. So I want to finish with that. Let's have some continuity. Let's have quality. Let's have academic freedom. Let's reject this motion and retain tenure. Thank you. Thank you, Tuna, for your speech. And we are going to hear the live speech for this debate from Don, the government rebuttal speech. Don, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, members of the House, and everyone that is here. Now, Tuna said many things. The fact is that the freedom of exchange of ideas, it's a very good thing. But ladies and gentlemen, the only problem is the freedom of exchange of ideas is not happening within the tenure system. Because the tenure system is that seven-year window in which those professors have to appeal to that corporate taskmaster, as Tuna so eloquently put it, so that they can actually get that job in the first place. This free exchange of ideas does not happen because people are not rewarded for their work within other fields. They are only rewarded for the work that they do within their own, within their own field. They are not rewarded for communication to other scholars. They are not rewarded for this communication of their ideas to other fields and other places. The fact is that they do not have this free exchange of ideas in the tenure system. Now, the future of the university. Let's see what we get when we don't have tenure. We no longer have these professors that have been stuck in this system for the last 50 years that do not teach any longer. The fact is that we have the influx of new ideas. We have the influx of the professors of this changing system that change with the ideas of society. The fact is that we get this influx of different ideas from different perspectives, not just whatever the university had previously dictated is acceptable for us to teach at this particular point. The fact is that we can have these professors come in here and try new ideas because they're no longer looking for their job. They're no longer looking to keep that job within that seven-year period. The fact is that once you eliminate this whole tenure 
healthcare system, you now have the ability for these professors to sit there to go out, to co-author papers, to sit there and to talk to other professors in various other fields so that they can sit there and combine ideas. They can have this exchange of information. It's no longer the elitist information that they keep to themselves, that they keep within the system and only and hoard it and keep it for themselves to sit there and to go out. Now, what we are offering you here on the side of government is for this freedom of exchange of ideas. The fact is that we no longer have this monk s system. The fact is that we are going to sit here and stay within our caves and, and hone this knowledge to the fact of only ourselves and then eventually publicizing it in an article or paper that is written so elitist the fact that only other scholars in our field can understand the knowledge and what is actually being said at that. The fact is that we are going to have this ability, that we're going to have for fresh professors with new ideas, with new thoughts, with new questions to teach our students, to sit there and to enlighten our team. Tim opened up with the fact is the purpose of the university is to support public discourse. This is precisely what this does. The fact is that we create better citizens by giving them these ideas. In the tenure system, you are not doing that. You are keeping the ideas within the professor's hands and it is staying there. It is not disseminating out into the people. The fact is that these people are not question. They're not going out and sitting there learning this, and it was only kept to the few elite individuals that want to sit there and to go on this. We do not have this exchange of ideas. The fact is that when you sit there and allow for this to happen, what you are doing is saying that we are going to put you through these hoops, through these loops, for the seven years and the fact is that you must conform to whatever it is that we have written in stone that is so vague and written in stone. The fact is that you must do this, otherwise you lose your job at seven year mark. The fact is that you don't have a job then. You have to go, like Cornell West did, from Harvard to Princeton and teach there now. The fact is that these professors then are stuck in a system in which they're rotating every seven years because they are trying to teach this new information, to put these new ideas out in these new ways. And the fact is that they are not academics solely. The purpose of these professors is not simply to do academic research. The fact is that they are to share ideas. They are to put these into the minds of the children, our future leaders, our future whatever it is that they're going to be out and doing. The fact is that we need these professors to sit there and to go out and to disseminate these ideas, not to hoard it to themselves, because that's precisely what you're getting when you keep the tenure system. It is for all of these reasons that we on side government proudly oppose the abolition of the system. Thank you. Thank you, Don, and thank you to all of the debaters for this great debate. Um, it's now time for the audience to speak. We would like to invite uh, everyone from the audience. If you would like to share your thoughts on the topic, or if you would like to tell us who do you agree with or who you don't agree with, you're welcome to walk or fly on this up to the stage and give us your short speech. I do see avatars moving around, but there's someone approaching the stage. Let's wait for that. You can, you are also welcome to ask the questions to the debaters, ask questions about their arguments or about their speeches. We actually have a text question here and I believe it's easier if I just read it out. Just a second. 
I'm wondering what the government wants the college system to look like. No accountability or checks? We are waiting for an answer from the government. Um, I, I think what we would like to see is not to have um, the tenure, is to have the tenure system which isn't based on necessarily um, the amount you can publish in seven years, but um, purely on how that research which you're doing, so not, not so much on the publication aspect of it, but how, the, how your classroom um, is being benefited by your research, and, and a more of an emphasis on, on the classroom experience. And, and, and I think constant evaluation is something that we want to see, because we don't think that anyone ever gets to a point in pro where they, they don't need to progress any farther. And so um, maybe what we can have is graduated security, you know, that, um, and, and, some, some, and a system like that. That's what we would hope for, I, I suppose. Okay, thank you. So you're welcome to write your speeches if you don't have an audio system at your side. And you're still welcome to go to the stage and give, you, give a short speech on whatever you think about the topic. We'll wait for some time. If anyone gets the courage together to walk on the, on the floor, Okay, I'm going to read out loud another question that we are getting from Karlsten, and the question is goes to the government side. It goes, what would be the protection against the turnover or turning out of professors from political environment or pressure without tenure? Don, do you want to take this one or do you want me to? Go for it, Tim. Okay, well, well you, have, you haven't answered it so far, so why start now? <laughs> Thank you, Tina. Well, one thing was we actually do see um, politicization under the current system. There was an incident at the University of Chicago where, um, and, and several incidents where people who have been uh, disliked for their politics, reasons under tenure have been then, then sought out to fire them. Not for those political reasons, but um, so that they found reasons for example, like plagiarism, they've looked at their footnotes and said your footnotes don't correspond to your work. Things which, you know, are equivalent of a witch hunt. But um, to protect against politicization, what we would like to see is that um, the professors are not, are judged, the, the, the purposes for firing would only be based on performance in the classroom. Now, we understand, yes, that this is um, also not, uh, very well, but at least it's open, and you have more than one representative coming in to judge your classroom. Where under the current system, the tenure process and the final tenure evaluation is private and secret, and that's the Supreme Court case which Don was talking about. That that no one can view or, or see the records of what happens in these evaluations, and we want to change that. Thank you. So we had two great questions from the audience, and we are still waiting for other questions or your ideas, thoughts on the topic. I have a question for Tuna. Can you hear me for the opposition? Yes, go ahead. What is the opposition's idea about protecting against intractability? Um, you said some sort of um, hopeful, optimistic things about using uh, different sorts of technologies, different sorts of um, achievements in technological areas for tenure track, but um, <laughs> that's not something that you see a lot on um, tenure uh, committees requirements. Like they're looking for old-fashioned things, and part of the idea of that is that once you get into tenure, you're familiar with the old things. You want to do the old things. And you want to see other people doing them. So, what we change now to actually in the old guard. Well, that's a very good question, and I have some personal experience with that. 
Uh, the first thing is, is that when you take a tenure track job, you ask to have an agreement about what will count for tenure. And I definitely said that I want to use technology. Uh, and this is when I took the job in 1982. Uh, I want to explore the use of technology, being a science fiction fan. Uh, so it was pretty easy for me to count you know, the internet stuff that I've done and the internet streaming debating the, the, that I've been involved with, etc. Now, I, I just want to say, though, that the multiple levels uh, really help. For example, my department fully appreciated my progressive and innovative work. A committee appointed by the College of Arts and Sciences, a couple of the members did not. They said, you know, we want more traditional kind of stuff. We don't want this new and different uh, stuff. And they were overruled by the dean and the provost, who said the university appreciated uh, my work, and also my outside evaluators were very positive about it, breaking new ground. In my experience, in scholarly work, new um, is good. Uh, and it can be different, and some people might not like it, but that's why we need uh, protection. And it, although not perfect, uh, I, I think there is room in multiple levels of review. Now, if you do new and different stuff that's bad, I guess you're 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 pretty much in trouble. But that's my take on that. I think Yano expects to get credit for this debate. Yeah. Uh, and, and can I just say, it really depends on the university you're at. I mean, if your university is progressive, then, you know, you have a chance to do more and different things. And if you're, you know, I don't want to name any, uh, I will, at Oral Roberts University, uh, you know, I'm not sure that that's going to necessarily uh, be true. Um, well, I think one, that one tenureship thing. provides an opportunity for the university to choose any criteria that they want to for their professors. So, I mean, University of Vermont could have different criteria than St. John's University, for instance. But that's exactly, Jacob, I think exactly that's the, the problem here, is that we're not really getting away from the norming behavior of universities, because just like you said, the university is choosing its own norms. And so... I think ac academic, the idea of academic freedom is harmful here because it's under the guise of academic freedom, but what's really happening is a norming behavior which self-replicates -replic it. And there's no denying the fact that there's a certain type of academia which comes out of U U University of Vermont, which is different than the type of academia which comes out of Oral Roberts University, or out of Princeton, or out of, you know, um, LaSalle. I think you got to be careful with arguments like that, Tim. Like, I mean, I think that I think it's interesting that this has come down to a discussion of almost like what are the rules and whether or not they should be changed versus who like whether or not we should have tenure at all. Like that's an interest. I mean, I mean, I see what you're saying, Tim, and I think that's definitely a valuable point. But you got to be careful with that kind of argument. I mean, also, Tim, uh, there's no reason that those arguments you're saying with the norming. Um, going away with uh, without tenureship, I mean, personally, I think it could get worse because of the constant evaluation. So anytime a faculty or, or professor steps out of the norm, their reevaluation would be instantly up um, so that they would be fired quicker. So there would be more norming without tenureship. I also just want to say thanks, everybody. This was a really um, fun debate. Um, uh, it was fun to be a part of it. Thank you very much for um, participating and doing this.
Well, I guess since I started it, I will end it. Thank you all for coming uh, to the world's very first virtual debate. Thanks a lot to St. John's University for providing our facilities. Uh, thanks to all of you for being involved. Uh, and it is my great honor to announce that these proceedings are closed.